and only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to this Partnerships in Clinical Trials webinar. Sorry for the slightly late start. Um, I'm your host Andy and I'll be shortly passing over to our chair and panellists from Ataxia UK. Um, and they'll be talking about involving patients and patient groups in clinical research. Um, we'll be going through a few questions and answers after each panellist finishes. So um, if you do have any questions, if you could please just type them into the box provided um, while, whilst they are speaking, and then um, I'll uh, ask them at the end of each panellist. So um, with that, I'll uh, pass over to um, the presenters. Hello everybody, so I'm Julie Greenfield, I'm a Tax UK's um, Research Manager and I'll be chairing this webinar today. So first of all, thank you very much to the organisers of the Partnership in Clinical Trials Conference for enabling us to do this webinar. And we're hoping to sort of discuss some of the partnerships between patients, patient groups and researchers and hopefully it will lead to an interesting discussion. We've invited four speakers, two people from Taxi UK, a patient and a researcher. So we're going to start off with Sue Millman, who's the CEO of Taxi UK, who will give a short presentation sort of highlighting the role of patients in what all the charity does. And then we'll move on to the next speakers after that. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, first of all, I thought that I should say something about the ataxias, although I'm anticipating uh, that most people joining us will know something about the ataxias. The ataxias are a set of degenerative, often life-limiting neurological conditions, uh, which produce problems with movement, balance, and speech. We don't know exactly how many people in the UK are affected, but based on a population study we did some years ago, we believe that there are about 10,000 adults. Our estimate is that there are 1,200 children affected, uh, but again, uh, nobody knows properly. We've attempted to survey neurologists without success. The ataxias can be, or anataxia can be, either genetic or idiopathic or acquired through uh, an accident or some sort of bodily trauma. The symptoms can be constant or they can be episodic coming now and again. Uh, in all instances, it tends to be a degenerative condition. We've done a lot of work on discovering genes and uh, Andrea Nemeth will be talking from her position as a, an expert uh, geneticist in ataxia a little later. Um, and so far we have uh, found around a hundred different types of genetic ataxia. There are a few types of ataxia which start in childhood or in teenage. Um, many others are late onset and even those which do begin in childhood or teenage can exceptionally be late onset. The most common ataxia in the UK is Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, where we believe that there are around 1,200 adults affected. Ataxia UK is working to um, find, in collaboration with our researchers, a cure for one or more ataxias by the year 2020, and we still believe that this is possible. So about Ataxia UK, the charity, um, well, I'll start at the bottom of this list and say that we provide support to people affected by ataxia, um, both patients and families and carers of patients. We offer a helpline, numerous uh, information publications, uh, information on our website, uh, and opportunities for patients to meet, uh, both at conferences and through our branches and support groups uh, which uh, number about 55 at the moment across the UK. One of the things which our member, the members of Ataxia UK have been very keen to see us do is to raise awareness of Ataxia. Uh, some years ago we did our first uh, market research and found that about 7.5% of the population know what it is. More recently, uh, about 18 months ago, we did some more market research and we've taken it to nearly 10%. Uh, maybe not all our efforts, but we believe that uh, what we have done has certainly contributed to raising awareness. 
Uh, we also uh, aim to improve the treatment and care that people with ataxia get. Uh, and we uh, seed fund research, and I will talk about these two in slightly more depth. So first of all, research funding, and you can see that the amount that we are able to inject into research goes up and down according to the amount of money that the organization is able to raise. You will also see an example of our collaboration upon this slide because you can see that the bits in green are projects where we have co-funded with another organization and also the, the uh, bits in red um, are also co-funded and where we have also administered the grant. So um, you can see that uh, there are some quite considerable amounts of funding going in to research, although uh, one has to say in the context of research uh, this is but a drop in the ocean. However, the years that you are looking at, there's nearly one and three quarter million pounds worth of investment, and the collaborations that we've engaged in has meant that 40% of that has come from co-funding. This co-funding uh, comes from a, a taxier charities across the world. Uh, we work very much in concert with the 17 charities of Eurotaxia, which is the alliance of patient groups dealing with ataxia across Europe. And we also work in partnership with Friedrich's Ataxia Research Association, FARA, in the United States, uh, and the National Ataxia Foundation, as well as FARA Australia. So some well-developed networking there, which is contributing to uh, the ability to us, uh, for all of us to be more joined up in our approaches to research. Looking at treatment and care, in, 19, in 2003 we did a survey of our members and one of the um, foremost things that that survey showed to us was that people had poor access to ataxia specialists of any sort. Um, be they geneticists, neurologists, speech therapists, or physiotherapists. And in general, the services they were receiving were not very joined up. So in response to uh, the clear need enunciated by members of Ataxia UK, we decided to launch on a strategy of establishing specialist Ataxia clinics within our National Health Service. And uh, the features of these were, um, are that uh, there is an expert neurologist or geneticist, that they should undertake research, and that there should be a specialist nurse to enable the service to be more joined up than simply an appointment with a neurologist. So 13 years later, there are now four specialist clinics in London, Sheffield, Newcastle, and um, in Oxford. And uh, these clinics, some of them have been able to establish multidisciplinary clinics, which mean that people are assessed um, in a holistic manner, um, not only by the neurologist and the specialist nurse, but perhaps by speech therapists, occupational therapists, and physiotherapists. And the feedback that we have had on all the centers, without exception, is that they are very, very popular um, with the patients. So 2017, we need to introduce a new strategic plan because our current strategic plan is running out. And we wanted to ask ourselves the questions which are on the screen. Who are our stakeholders and what do they think? Are we putting patients at the center of all we do? Is the Ataxia UK addressing the right challenges? And are we setting the right priorities? And also, what does the wider landscape tell us about the environment and climate in which we are operating in? As a first step to assembling this strategic plan, given that we want to put patients, at the, patients and people affected by ataxia at the center of all we do, we launched a survey of uh, our friends, uh, members of Ataxia UK. And over the summer, we sent the survey to 
four and a half thousand households and we got 436 responses. In the main, those responses were from people with ataxia and just 15% of the responses came from carers. That was slightly disappointing because we wanted to have a response in the round from everybody, but on the other hand, the information from the survey is going to keep us busy for many months to come. 69% of people um, had cerebellar ataxia that responded to the survey and 15% of people with Friedrich's ataxia. And that's actually not far off the uh, estimate that we um, believe uh, of the prevalence of Friedrich's and the other ataxias. So that was a good bit of confirmation. So we asked people about their health problems, and this is just a snapshot of some of the responses that they gave. Um, there were um, not that many surprises in terms of the actual symptoms that people display. It is not surprising, given that people have ataxia, that there should be problems with balance and walking and clumsiness and falling. And we also know that slurred, slurred speech and dysarthria is common among people with ataxia. But I think that we were surprised at the percentages that uh, we found uh, when we uh, examined them. Um, because, for example, 87% of people um, with FA had uh, problems with slurred speech and dysarthria, and 73% in total covering all of the ataxias. So, um, to us, that's, those percentages seemed pretty high. Um, we encounter people uh, with ataxia very often, and certainly we didn't have the feeling that uh, pronounced problems existed in that higher percentage. But this is a survey taken from the patient's point of view. So obviously patients are telling us that this is a bigger problem than we presumed it had been, um, used to presume it was. The other figures that are highlighted in red are also surprising to us, not because of the symptoms themselves, but because of the prevalence of the symptoms. And what this, what this survey in this area will um, assist us to do is to target our research and our services towards these issues, uh, which we have not currently given any uh, highlighting to. Um, for example, we believe that what we should be doing is forming links with um, charities that deal with bladder problems. Um, we can be pointing our uh, members to information that they have, and we can also be discussing with them whether there, is, um, whether there are possibilities of doing, doing joint research. Um, and similarly, um, with the coughing and choking issues and the fatigue. We asked people what was the impact of ataxia upon them, and we found that um, people's, uh, the, we found here the enormity of the problems that people face with ataxia. It is not simply a question of dealing with the physical problems. Ataxia is an all-encompassing condition which, which makes people fearful about the future and makes it difficult to cope with the exhaustion and fatigue which accompanies us, and, and also produces isolation and depression. And clearly this is also going to figure in our approach towards um, services and research in the future. Coming on to treatment and care, what we find is that the number of people using um, specialist ataxia clinics is roughly just over a third, and when we have totted up how many people we believe in total are being carried as cases by ataxia clinics, um, that also comes to around about a third. So we feel that there's some good validation of the research there, uh, of the survey rather. Um, what we think is also significant is the fact that in a number of areas, the, the, under, the, the demand for services roughly exceeds the services provided by about 50%.
And this is quite a significant figure, and it encourages us to think that we should be um, creating at least one or two more ataxia centers, uh, specifically in areas where people um, are unable to travel from, um, where they are more remote from the current ataxia centers. So what are people's priorities? Well, very clearly, people's priorities. We ask people to name uh, their top four priorities, and they're shown here with a, a weighting on the graph, uh, according to whether they were somebody's highest or lowest priority. And very clearly, supporting scientific and medical research comes out as people's top priority. And uh, in the context of us being an organization which funds research and wishes to engage people in that research, um, we find this very confirmatory of, uh, of the path on which we are placed. Uh, and we believe it also indicates that when approached, people will be keen to get involved in research projects, and indeed we have found this in the past. So, Ataxia UK has the very clear aim and vision of uh, achieving a cure for one or more of the ataxias uh, by 2020. And as I said, the developments in research at the moment indicate to us that while there may not be something on the shelves, we are making sufficient progress to hope that there will be something discovered by 2020 that will, that will um, alleviate people's symptoms of one or more of the ataxias and uh, will um, assist us to uh, uh, further our objectives of putting patients at the centre. Thank you, everybody. I don't know if you have any uh, questions relating to my presentation, um, but I'm very happy to take them now. And do you have any questions? Yes, um, one second. We do have a couple of questions that have come through. Um, so the first one is, um, hang on one second, let me just get it up. The first one, um, what is the ratio in research for Friedrichs and dominant? Okay, um, so at the present we are funding, 50% uh, of the projects that we are funding are um, cerebellar ataxias and 50% of the projects we are funding are Friedrichs ataxias. Um, and we are very careful to make sure that there is a balance of projects, um, not between Friedrichs and dominant, because there are some recessive um, ataxias which are not Friedrichs, but between Friedrichs and everything else. However, it is the case that many of our um, more wealthy donors and many of our more active fundraisers um, actually designate their funds for um, ataxia research, uh, for Friedrich's research, and consequently, um, we find that they. Um, th so consequently, we find that we ha often have more Friedrich's money to invest simply because that's how the donors have dictated it. Okay, thank you, and. Um... We have one more question, um, and it's about um, is basically someone um, attends a clinic um, more local to her than traveling to London, and um, is there a way to have a taxi a nurse at these consultations? Uh, no, I'm afraid that the ataxia nurse is, what happens when we are establishing an, uh, an ataxia centre is that we pay for the nurse for a couple of years while the ataxia centre builds up the caseload. Uh, and um, after that period, uh, we've managed, when we've managed to prove to the NHS that there is a need for the clinic, then the NHS takes over the funding of it. So unfortunately, we're not able to um, send our ataxia nurses around the country. And indeed, in fact, at a couple of the clinics, the ataxia nurses are very much um, funded by research money. Um, and so they are there and present at the clinics, but they're actually funded to participate in the, re in the research primarily. Uh, and I should have focused a little bit more on how much research is done at the ataxia clinics 
It, it, we do insist that um, for um, a, a clinic to be established, there should be research undertaken because they are going to establish a large cohort of patients at the clinic, and it would be a terrible waste not to undertake research in those uh, circumstances. Lovely. So shall we move on to the next speaker? Um, so the next speaker is Richard Brown, who has a taxi himself, and he's also a trustee of the Taxi UK, has worked as a trustee. So uh, Richard, would you like to start telling us a little bit about uh, yourself and the diagnosis? Yes. Um, can, you, can everyone hear me? I'm, uh, my yes. name's Richard Brown. Um, I was diagnosed um, when I was 15. Um, I'm 40 now, so that was 25 years ago. Um, I started noticing um, general uh, fatigue and tiredness when I was at school. Um, and after a lot of head scratching and quite a few tests, um, we went to Oxford um, and I was, I was, uh, had some tests um, and I was um, you know, told I had Friedrich's attacks here. Thank you. And so can you tell us a little bit about how you learn about research, how you keep yourself informed, and in particular how that helps you in your role as a trustee of the Taxi UK? Yes, well, the the um, Ataxia, um, I, ca I came to Ataxia quite late. Um, it was only really when I retired five years ago that I sort of became involved in charity more. But uh, I'm I'm aware of a very, there's a very powerful uh, community on Facebook um, and also online on a, on a website called Health Unlocked. There's um, a lot of experts and, and very knowledgeable people with uh, sort of information they share about Ataxia. That's very helpful. Um, being a trustee for me was it was another good way of finding out in in the board papers uh, what the how research there was somebody asked telling you about research, um, and the, the trustees actually um, you know did follow the recommendations that were given to them. Uh, by medical advisors, but um, do get to uh, you know sort of hear about research first and and direct which research Tax UK is going to support. So uh, it 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 was very useful for me as a trustee to be able to uh, learn about the research and who was doing it and where it was being done and how how you know had had it involved uh, patients or. Uh, so, so that's very good. The website's very good. That's uh, lots of information. I have a copy of the clinical guidelines which um, Tax UK produce, which um, is a document intended for medical practitioners. Um, and I always say that to uh, to patients like myself that because ataxia is so little known, um, you you have no choice but to become an expert in it yourself and a practitioner yourself and you know so the information this charity gives in in the uh, guidelines is really helpful uh, to all of us you know sort of battling with the tax here. Thank you yes and moving on to um, the more sort of research and clinical side mm -hmm. um, I understand that you've attended the Oxford Ataxia Clinic so can you tell us a little bit about your experience there, you know, why you decided to attend, um, and also if you've been involved in any research studies at all? Yes, well, um, I, I came to a taxi quite late, um, not having had much contact with uh, medical experts um, throughout the, the sort of first 20 years of my condition. Um, and as a trustee, um, I was doing a lot of visits to branches and groups in the Midlands and I felt that um, I had to you know go to a, a nearby centre because there was so much talk of them and uh, uh, at conference every year you know it's a big thing about uh, the clinics and people always talk about them so I wanted to go along and see you know how, how the clinic would integrate into um, my, my experience with Tatia. Um, and so I, I made, that was really, I didn't have um, a particular sort of issue that I wanted to talk about, but um, I went along and I met Dr. Nemeth um, and I, I, it was last year 
Um, and I, I would say that it was generally one of the first times in my life that I'd had a conversation with the medical practitioner who I didn't have to explain exactly everything about my condition and how I was feeling or what I was struggling with. Dr. Nemeth, being an expert in ataxia, already knew. Um, you know, it was such an easy conversation to have. Um, and the ataxia nurse that was there was uh, was wonderful and practical and the same the same level of knowledge and understanding. It really it really made a big difference to me. Um, the best thing I think about the uh, the actual visit was uh, that the local branch, the Oxford branch, had um, established a kind of uh, presence there. So after after your consultation, you'd uh, which often I mean can be quite devastating to go from a uh, you know feeling a bit tired. Uh, you know, I'm not quite understanding why to finding out you have this this massive uh, condition. It was it was really nice to actually go and meet the uh, the the other people in the branch, sit with them. They they talk to you, offer you support, um, and for me it was a real it was a real sort of holistic approach to. Um, in one day you 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 would get the opportunity to ask all the detailed medical questions that you need. Um, and then straight afterwards, you get the chance to get all the support you'd need from uh, the members of the group. So it, it was um, it was really good research uh, for me. I've um, I keep saying I came to a taxi quite late, and I sort of I I sort of felt that a typical research um, requires patients of um, younger age than I. Although I know that I realise that isn't always true, but um, it is so. Um, I haven't actually uh, participated in uh, many. Re I've I've sort of um, signed up for a few, um, and I've talked talked to people and you know given them my details and 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 there was a, a doctor at MS clinic. There was um, I I did that and signed up for a for a trial. Some work she she was doing, um, but I I do know. Uh, people who have done uh, the the trials, and they they feel they're very important. Um, you know, they, they they can't do very much, and that ataxia um, can be very disempowering. And I I think that people, especially younger people, they feel that they're actually doing something. Uh, they're making a difference in the in the struggle, and they're helping other people by by doing. So they're very popular. Um, and you know, very, uh, very well, uh, well done. I think as well the uh, research. Thank you, Richard. Yes, it's really reassuring to hear that uh, you know that attending the uh, the clinic, specialist clinic, was beneficial to you. Certainly, it's something that we hear a lot. Um, and also, as you mentioned, the Ataxi UK Volunteer Scheme, that was quite a novel thing that we established at the first clinic in London a number of years ago, and is a really, as you said, very holistic way of, uh, of uh, engaging with, uh, with patients and patients groups actually after the clinic appointment. So it's, you know, when people are just, have seen the specialist, I think, uh, as you say, it's quite nice to then be able to engage with the charity immediately and sort of start, start up a uh, conversation at that early stage. So thank you so much for sharing uh, all that with us, Richard. Have we got any questions at all before we move on to the next speaker? Um, so not so much, quite, well, yes, it is a question. Um, basically, um, someone saying, uh, very interesting to listen to Richard, and I can empathise. Um, and I would just add that um, can we contribute towards meaningful statistics as well? Agreed? Towards, sorry? Meaningful statistics. Um, so, sorry, I'll, I'll read that. So this is someone um, who also suffers from ataxia saying, interesting to listen to Richard and I empathise. I would just add that we contribute towards meaningful statistics. Um, agreed? Yes. Yes. So, Richard. Yes. So, asking us if we, if we agree with the fact that that being part of research, you contribute a lot. Uh, to oh, cool. Yes, it, it's very valuable to um, you know to um, uh, I mean the the the, the actual research um, you know needs needs people to uh, needs people to volunteer and uh, it's 
it's a very important thing to do. It um, and it's like I said before, it's one of the one of the things that you can do to to um, you know kind of fight against ataxia and uh, help people and help other people with it. So uh, it's a very meaningful and very worthwhile thing to do. And there's links to it on the taxi website. Um, I'd recommend you know that anyone can look on there uh, or talk to their nearest centre or clinic and find out what uh, what research is taking place or what's recruiting volunteers. Um, and there is a database um, as well um, that you can join, um, and is I believe it's held by Taxi UK, um, and you sort of enter your details in there, and it's kept. It's kept, yes, it's kept. As, a, as a register for trials and for research studies, yeah. yes, absolutely, yes. Um, so I think maybe we should move on to the next speaker. Yep. Um, so We do have one more uh, question if we have uh, okay, just, okay. just a quick answer. Um, have you considered, Richard, ever offering your experience to inform the types of research that is needed, i.e. what the research, research question should be? Um, I... I uh, spent four years as a trustee, um, and in putting into into that kind of uh, sort of um, direction, strategic direction of the charity, um, and again, which I recommend, you know, anyone can, uh, you know, can be, get involved in the charity that way and and help out. Um, I'm I'm as a person, I'm very interested in the social aspect of the disability. Um, so that it's that's more the direction I've taken, but um, I, I do I, I do I did um, you know join up as a trustee and was able to uh, get involved that way. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Julie Velotigara, who's a Taxi Case Research Officer, and she will actually also be a speaker at the. Um, the Partnership in Clinical Trials conference that will be taking place in November. Um, so, um, Julie, so if you'd like to sort of tell us a little bit about some examples of how um, how patient groups, so how Taxi UK engages patients in the research process, and how you think that might be beneficial. Yeah, sure. So. Um, here at Taxi UK, we engage patients in the research process at different stages. Um, so maybe the first example I'd like to talk about is the scientific advisory committee that we have here. Uh, members, uh, scientific members, but also lay members taking part in discussion uh, to review uh, and uh, rank uh, grant applications that we receive. Uh, we meet three times a year. And then from this committee, recommendations are made to uh, the trustee board uh, that uh, Richard mentioned, and then the trustees make the final decision about the project that we should be uh, funding. So we invite lay members to take part to our scientific advisory committee, to take part in the process of grant selection. Uh, so um, we, here we have patient voice in discussion about uh, the design of, uh, of studies at the preliminary stage when we receive preliminary application, but also at the full application stage. Um, we also thank um, our lay members to uh, take part and to uh, take initiatives in this committee. Uh, one of our lay members um, submitted a, a scoring system to uh, help the committee to rank the full preliminary, preliminary applications because we receive quite a lot at each uh, round. So uh, this system is now being implemented and we're using it. Uh, it's also very important for us to hear from these members about the, the feasibility of some uh, functional studies when we receive studies uh, using a physiotherapy approach or functional approach uh, to uh, assess the symptoms or develop new assessment tools. Obviously, uh, lay members who are uh, people living with a condition are in the best position to uh, tell the committee if these tests is feasible in the first place before we even think about funding this study. So I think um, Ataxia UK is, is really engaging patients in, in this crucial uh, stage of uh, funding research and relevant research to make progress and to find new treatments. Um, I think we're making also science accessible to, um, to lay members but also to people living with the condition uh, by asking lay summaries in the project we receive. We put these uh, lay summaries when we fund research 
uh, on our website. Uh, we send papers uh, to our uh, members of the committee in advance. Uh, and then if any question or discussion is needed before the, the, the meeting, we, uh, we make ourselves available to do so. So I think this is a crucial um, you know, patient engagement there. Um, I think there is another way, obviously, to engage patients in, in uh, crucial steps of, of research. It's to engage in research studies um, by running workshops and groups of discussion with um, um, people living with a condition who have any interest uh, in the research and wants to make the difference and get their voice uh, heard in order to, to design uh, new clinical studies that will be more adapted to people living with the condition. So uh, looking at trial design, uh, clinical study design, we run a workshop of that kind. Uh, we also consult uh, people living with the condition uh, to review some patient information sheets or leaflets that we have that we distribute to our members uh, as well as the general public or we put it live on our websites. Um, obviously we help enrollment to uh, participants to clinical studies, to the one that we fund that we are involved in, but also the one that we don't fund because we want to collaborate and play an important role uh, in an international community of, of clinical studies run by different pharmaceutical companies and different organizations worldwide. So we help recruitment when a new study opens and then if we can get at this stage the patient voice heard and, and maybe uh, um, slightly change the, 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 the study design that will guarantee the patient will take part in the study and last the whole time of the study and being really engaged and feeling this is a useful study to take part on, then we also play this role and the patient have a very important role to play in this uh, particular um, example of clinical research. And finally, this has been already mentioned, we have a patient registry, uh, so uh, we publicize um, recruitment to clinical studies on our website, but also it happens that we, we do uh, targeted emails to recruit participants to study um, opening. So I think that kind of answers and give a bit of example of what we do and how it's important uh, to give the, the patient role and patient voice in different stages of the research process. Yeah, thank you. And in terms of, so this is very much sort of involving patients uh, in the research process, both in funding and sort of helping us with the design and things. Uh, so are there other things in terms of other partnerships? So the partnerships that Tax UK might have with researchers and sort of would you like to explain a bit more about those partnerships? Yes, I think it's important to cover at this point and to see how uh, patient groups uh, uh, such as uh, at Tax UK and others can really help the research process by uh, fostering collaboration and, and developing partnerships to work together. So I think patient groups such as uh, Ataxa UK have a, a, a great knowledge and understanding of, of the condition uh, that uh, we're working on. And this is this expertise that we have and we, we're, we're happy to share and to engage with various partners playing a key role in clinical research. Uh, this is something very valuable and uh, we can play a very important role as a partner uh, to develop new clinical research that will be relevant and will make a difference for, for, for patients in the near future. So we have a great network of researchers and, and clinicians uh, who have the expertise uh, in ataxia and also they have uh, an interest in, in working on this condition. And we work closely with uh, this registry of uh, researchers and, and clinicians and, and also as I said before we have access to uh, patient registries. So I think for me it's, it's quite obvious that patient groups can really help to foster collaborations and, and, and promote research uh, widely and it should be a key partner and not left to the side but invited to discuss. Okay to clinical research. I mean, another example to highlight what I've just said is uh, it's actually has organized uh, last year in partnership with three other patient groups, the largest international research conference on ataxia ever organized, where a community of 350 researchers, clinicians, and pharmaceutical companies gathered to talk about research progress, about clin future clinical trials, and they also got the opportunity to meet patients uh, at this conference. As an outcome of this event, the majority of delegates that who attended this, this uh, great conference said in their feedback that this event was very useful for advancing their work 
and rated the scientific content of the conference as uh, being outstanding. And I also believe that they made a crucial new contacts at this conference um, that will enhance uh, their work. So again, um, seeing patient groups being able to organize um, an event of that scale uh, where um, new clinical trials were announced and, and many more collaborations were set up, it's also an example of uh, how we can achieve and how we could work with other partners in clinical research. Thank you. Yes, that's excellent. Um, have we got any questions on this sort of aspect of uh, research engagement from the charity? We all? do, yes. We have one question. Um, how do you train your lay members to be useful members of the Scientific Advisory Board? Ah, that's a very good question. Thank you. So, um, how do we train them? So, first of all, they, when they get in touch with us as uh, expressing interests, uh, in, in, in research and taking part of uh, this committee. So we, we have a discussion with them about uh, um, how the committee is run, uh, what happens during these meetings. Um, we ask them to send a CV and a cover letter that can express their uh, enthusiasm, uh, interest, um, any particular maybe skill they may have from their CV that could be also very useful to take part in committee discussion. Uh, as I said before, to be a lay member, um, this person has to be uh, has to have the condition or be really a, a relative or somebody living close to somebody who has the condition to also have this personal um, engagement with the condition and and to help the the charity to run this research uh, program in the best way. Uh, and then. Um, when the committee meets again, then we, we look at CVs and cover letters and, and, and we discuss the, the potential uh, different candidates. And, and um, we, we, it's an open discussion and uh, we obviously welcome people to take part of the committee uh, enthusiasm. And uh, at, at the moment, uh, we actually have a quite high number of uh, lay members. We have four um, people uh, part of the committee and uh, uh, around 10 scientists. Um, and I think in terms of training, it really is like about commitment uh, to read papers um, before meeting, uh, to, be, to ensure that they understand the pro pro what the project is about. Obviously, the lay summary is made for them, um, to understand the, the challenge of the project. Uh, so making lay, uh, this summary lay, when we ask uh, researchers to submit a grant, grant application to us, they have to write a summary in lay terms, and this summary has to be understood by somebody that doesn't have a research background. So um, obviously we ensure that lay members are able to understand the, the topic of the research, the challenges, but also the difficulties of that project and, and to be able to take part of the, of the discussion on the day of, um, of the committee. Um, so I think uh, the more or less to the question, maybe Julie wants to add something or? Yeah, so the other thing is that because we have a research officer and a research manager in the Attacks UK office, um, lay members can discuss with us projects in advance of the meeting if they find that something's not very clear. Um, as Julie said, the lay summary is really crucial. Um, and they uh, um, and we do find that sort of different people have different perspectives, perspectives to add. So you know, even looking at the grant application and some of the the implications and and sort of seeing whether it's it's um, it's something that could actually be useful in the long term. So looking at the project from those eyes, that perspective, I think, is very important. It's something that standing back as a lay person, as a patient, is something that maybe you're looking more into a project rather than maybe some of the scientific members who might be looking in more depth at the science. Um, but yes, I think in terms of training, having the opportunity to, to talk to us and be trained on the job in a way as you go along each meeting um, is also something that, uh, that uh, hopefully people would find useful. Was there anything else at all that anybody wanted to add? Otherwise, we can pass on to the next speaker. Um, there was, yes, one more question. Um, is Ataxia UK also involved in fundamental research? Yes, we are. It's a very good question. And you see, today we're trying to highlight uh, engagement in clinical research as part of uh, the, the, to the topic of uh, this conference coming up in November. Uh, but we are engaged in fundamental uh, research. Uh, we, in fact, uh, our research strategy covers 
a, a spectrum of research projects uh, aiming to improve the diagnosis of different types of attacks as well as uh, developing new cell or animal models of the different types of attacks that were, which allow researchers to use these models to make progress and, and identify new molecules or new targets that could be used for research and development uh, for new treatments. Um, so, uh, we are very much interested in understanding the mechanism, the molecular mechanisms or the, the, the genetics, um, genetic hallmarks or, or, or mutations uh, or new um, mechanism in, in get involved in different types of attacks uh, that we don't know very much of because, I mean, as we said, pre drugs attacks is the most common form of uh, attacks that has been quite well researched, but there's many of the type of attacks that are much rarer than this one that's been under-researched and there's very little known about them. And um, as long as we don't know much about the mechanism of how the disease is developed and how it leads to these different uh, uh, symptoms that people experience when they live with the condition, then it's very hard to develop new treatments because we know very little about it. So Ataxelica has a very ambitious uh, research strategy to cover fundamental research as well as preclinical studies uh, and clinical studies um, aiming to look at improving the diagnosis, developing new treatments, but also alleviating symptoms by developing new therapies. Thank you. So I think we'd better move on to the last speaker. Um, so the last speaker is um, Dr. Andrea Lemon, um, and she is a geneticist at the Oxford Clinic. Um, so Andrea, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the specialist uh, ataxia clinic in Oxford that was established, as Sue said at the start, in partnership with Ataxia UK? and maybe tell us a bit about the clinic and how that helps you in research. Um, okay, um, can, can you actually hear me? Yes, yes. Because um, I can't hear you. We can hear you. Excellent. I, I can, okay. I can. Uh, no, I can't, I can't hear you at all. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, Okay. Okay, so um, we run one of the uh, ataxia clinics in the UK. Uh, as you've already heard, it has um, a number of clinicians, uh, uh, nursing staff, and volunteers. Um, and I think that um, the relationship between the patients uh, coming into the clinic, uh, seeing uh, our staff, and also having a, a close interaction with um, Ataxia UK uh, is really absolutely essential to the research uh, process. Um, so there are numerous components to this. Um, obviously, research comes in many different forms, as you've already heard. It may be basic laboratory research, uh, for example, trying to find some of the new genes that cause ataxia that we don't yet know about. Um, once we find these, we can then feed them into the diagnostic process, which uh, shortens the time uh, that patients may need to uh, come and be investigated. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, received a lot of funding from Ataxia UK to uh, improve the diagnostic pathway very dramatically in the last uh, five or six years. Um, it also um, means uh, collecting cohorts of patients. Um, and this is uh, absolutely critical for um, clinical trials and natural history studies. Um, and um, finally, uh, it's important for um, seeing patients for actual clinical trials. Um, and so the patients themselves, when they come to the clinic, uh, may also be involved in Ataxia UK. And so we may, we may make them aware of, of various studies. But if they aren't aware of them, they may uh, be able to find out about them through newsletters, which are uh, really, really important. And if we're going to think about the long term of um, clinical trial, then what you may be aware of is that when you get to the point of clinical trial, you have to um, 
sorry, I'm just turning the phone off. You have to um, uh, have a very rapid uh, recruitment phase. So pharma companies want us to be able to recruit very quickly. So even if you're not involved in a, a research study or a clinical trial, um, at, at the time of the initial consultation, and it may seem like a few years, maintaining contact with the clinic uh, is absolutely essential because we then have an idea about how many patients are out there with a specific uh, genetic diagnosis, for example, that we can then very quickly recruit um, into uh, clinical trials. Um, the other really important thing at the moment, which some of you will be aware of, is that many of the ataxias, uh, genetic ataxias, are incredibly rare. And so if we only have one patient, it's very difficult to know whether we've actually found the specific cause. Uh, and this is where uh, collaboration with lots of other teams is really important. So uh, we've recently identified from one of our uh, patients uh, a new uh, gene causing uh, a dominant ataxia. Uh, and after contacting the group in London, we found another case. Um, and this is a particularly interesting uh, gene because we think that uh, it may uh, be amenable to new pharmacological treatments. And so we're hoping that we're going to be able to design research experiments around that. Um, and so uh, all of these uh, different strands uh, between the patients, Ataxia UK, and the clinicians all coming together uh, within the, the clinical environment uh, really move forward the research in a very fundamental way. And I think anybody who's been involved in any of the clinics in the UK uh, will probably have experienced that in one way or another. Thank you. Yes, that's, uh, that's very true. I think uh, definitely something very valued. Um, and in terms of, um, so thank you for highlighting all about the different research studies and uh, that are so essential and can take place at the clinic. Um, another sort of uh, a partnership that we had with the Tax UK was to do with the um, reduction of the medical guidelines. Can you say a bit more about that maybe? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch that, that the, um, the telephone is very poor. Could you just repeat that? Mm. So I was just talking about uh, the uh, whether you want to say something about the medical guidelines and our partnership with the Tax UK and your help in that. Yeah, yeah so, so this, was, um, this, this is a, a, a quite a, a long-term project um, that has been going for a number of years. and. Um, it's really uh, been very, very important in highlighting uh, the way that patients with ataxia uh, should come through clinical services um, because they may present to a wide variety of clinicians, uh, either pediatricians initially or adult uh, neurologists. They may come directly through genetics uh, if there is a known family history. They may see uh, orthopedic uh, surgeons or uh, be identified by a cardiac clinic. So there's a, a, a lot of ways that patients initially present to the clinical services. And um, if they don't find their way to an ataxia clinic immediately, um, then there needs to be a lot of help and support for the relevant clinicians on how to uh, start to investigate the patient uh, what kind of blood tests need to be done, so metabolic tests, um, what kind of genetic tests need to be done, what kind of imaging is required, whether there are more invasive tests, which we are trying to uh, reduce uh, with the other types of tests nowadays, so particularly genetics, but sometimes more invasive tests like skin biopsies or lumbar punctures are required, um, and uh, get the patient to a clinician who knows enough about the con condition to be able to start to uh, manage this. And one of the uh, keys of the ataxia clinics is not that we can provide specific expertise in every single area. So uh, I know a lot about ataxia, but I'm not a cardiologist or an orthopedic surgeon, for example. But we know the right uh, cardiologist to send the patients to. Um, and so the guidelines are really there to 
try and draw this all together and help uh, clinicians, particularly in areas where there aren't uh, specific ataxia clinics, uh, to try and draw together the relevant services and highlight to um, what, first of all, what investigations are required, uh, and once a diagnosis is made, what kind of support the patients need. Um, and one of the, the, the really useful things may be, first of all, that clinicians themselves can go to their relevant trusts and say, you know, I've read, I've read these guidelines. It's really important that I get some more access to specific services. Or it may actually be that the patients can go along to those clinicians and say, listen, I, you know, I've got this condition. I know it's not very common, so you may not have seen a case like this. But here are the guidelines. Um, could you uh, assist me in getting to the relevant people? Um, and, and that's actually really fundamentally important because at the moment there are only four ataxia centers uh, in the UK. And obviously uh, that means that there are patients who live many, many, many hundreds of miles from these clinics and still can't uh, access them. And of course, the the ultimate goal is that we can provide more clinics, more expertise uh, throughout the UK, but at the moment, uh, realistically, with the health services as they are, it is not always it is not always possible. And so the guidelines are really there uh, to assist uh, the patients and the clinicians in getting the right services. I should also say, actually, that these guidelines are so good that they aren't just used in the UK, they are actually used worldwide because they have so many excellent references uh, to help clinicians uh, look up uh, uh, specific pieces of information. Uh, they have a very good summaries, for example, of different types of genetic conditions. So if you're scratching your head about uh, what type of testing to do and where to access it, uh, the genetic testing will help you with that. Uh, really important uh, highlighting speech therapy and physiotherapy and so on. So they're very comprehensive guidelines. Uh, and they're really a, a kind of a management textbook, if you like, uh, that are used worldwide. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Andy, have we got any questions um, after this speaker? Uh, yes, we do. Um, we have, um, we'll have to go quite quickly because we're obviously running a little late. But um, So firstly, a uh, big question, will Brexit affect the future funding or focus of Ataxia UK research? Um, well, if you're, asking, if you're asking me that, obviously ATAXI UK may have some information on that. Uh, I think there is concern uh, about how uh, international funding um, collaborations are going to work uh, at, at, to their optimum, um, particularly as the European Union uh, has uh, provided directly or indirectly quite a lot of research. Um, and certainly many of the universities are extremely concerned about this. Uh, I think that we, we uh, as, a, as a group, one of the, the advantages of working closely together is that we will be able to lobby uh, the government to highlight to them if there are going to be gaps in the funding that we need to fill in other ways. Yes, I mean, just to add to that, um, there were a lot of anecdotal stories of uh, British laboratories being asked to withdraw from applications to Europe immediately after the Brexit vote. There was quite a lot of pressure put on the government and in response what they announced was that they would pick up any funding um, for British laboratories um, were they to enter into Horizon 2020 bids and for us subsequently to leave the EU. So in other words, British laboratories can join in partnership bids and beyond Brexit, the government will then meet those costs. So we hope that that has stopped the rot. But there is a great deal of concern um, and there is also a degree of um, uncertainty and insecurity perhaps amongst uh, those foreign, um, uh, foreign staff of British research laboratories. So people who've come from Europe, and there are a lot of them, working in British laboratories, who, who maybe are starting to feel a little insecure. Uh, and we hope that um, the government will pretty soon offer some 
reassurance about uh, not asking people to leave who are already working here and, and enable the work to continue unimpeded. Okay, and um, one final question um, is, uh, what guidelines would you have for other patient groups about how to develop the relationship with or work with commercial companies developing clinical trials? Um, I, if that's directed, again, if it's directed at me, I, I, I would suggest that um, uh, it is all, all patient group for whatever condition it is, and ATAC is the one we're particularly interested in, um, should uh, maintain uh, communication with both the clinician and uh, with ATACTIA UK or the other um, uh, charities that are, are supporting them. Uh, as I said, one of the absolutely fundamental um, factors for uh, pharma companies, for example, who want to fund this is that they know that there are large enough groups of patients out there who are willing to participate that when it comes to recruitment um, that uh, there are enough patients to recruit quickly because pharma companies uh, have to pay vast amounts of money from the day that um, uh, a study opens and if recruitment is very slow um, then they have to they have to essentially waste an awful lot of money um, and that is a major concern for them. And if you look at um, other conditions which have been very successful, uh, so the one I've been involved in is Huntington's disease, uh, one of the things that we worked very hard to do was to ensure that we had a close communication with patients so that on the day that we needed to uh, click and say, yes, we are open for recruitment, we already had patients lined up and ready to go. And Although, as I said before, I appreciate that for many patients it can be difficult to uh, attend clinics, um, it's absolutely essential that we know that they are out there. And so uh, if, we, if we don't see them and if we can't contact them via ATACTIA UK, then we don't have strong enough recruitment to persuade the pharma companies uh, to invest in this, even though it's a very worthwhile cause. So maintaining contact with us is absolutely essential. So I, I think that uh, Andrea's advice is really good uh, advice to other patient groups. We have to make ourselves invaluable to the pharma and to the researchers. We have to make sure that pharma understand and researchers understand that they need patient groups. That means raising our, our profile as much as possible. It means having information readily at our disposal to be able to provide them with briefings about the condition, with, as Andrea says, the, the numbers of patients that they need for trials. Uh, we need to establish our credibility with them. Uh, and one of the other things I think that helps establish, has helped establish Ataxia UK's credibility and the credibility of Ataxia research in general is the highly developed links there are between the international, the, the Ataxia charities worldwide. Uh, we, speak to, we speak to our colleagues in America and across Europe at least once a month and, and, and very often more often than that. And we need to model the collaborative behaviors with our patients and researchers that we expect farmers to, to demonstrate. And, and what we have found is that as we have got nearer um, finding things to take to market, then the farmers have become more interested and have be wanted to become engaged with us because they see us as crucial partners in that road. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to have to finish there. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Um, any questions we didn't get through, you will be getting a follow-up email shortly after this that will have contact information on it. Um, so if you do want to get in touch with anyone that's been speaking, um, you'll be able to in that email. Um, so thank you very much to all the panellists, um, and you will be able to see Dr. Julie Valdegoria at the Partnerships in Clinical Trials Europe Conference um, in Vienna, and that's 16th, 17th November. Um, again, in the email, there'll be links to that if you do want to come. So with that, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for your questions, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.